Welcome uh, to the Dean's discussion uh, on uh, race and the pandemic. Um, we started Dean's discussions a few years ago uh, in response to questions or comments from people at the Kennedy School um, who are interested in learning uh, from our faculty experts on particular topics, um, but weren't taking courses or couldn't take a particular course uh, in which they could get that that learning. Um, and so we set up these discussions as a way to bring our community together uh, to learn about uh, important issues. Uh, we have a fundamentally important issue on the table today. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, to uh, four colleagues of mine for uh, being on this panel. I will give you uh, just a sentence of introduction about each of them because I know you've come to hear from them, uh, not from me. Um, in alphabetical order, uh, Desmond Ang is an assistant professor at the Kennedy School. He's an economist, particularly interested in the intersection of race, uh, education, and government. Uh, Cornell Brooks is a professor of the practice of public leadership and social justice at the Kennedy School. He's also the Hauser Professor of the practice of nonprofit organizations. Uh, and he has an appointment at the Harvard Divinity School where he is a visiting professor of the practice of prophetic religion and public leadership. Uh, Khalil uh, Muhammad is professor of history, race, and public policy at the Kenny School. Um, he's also has an appointment at the Radcliffe Institute, where he's the Suzanne Young Murray professor. Uh, and uh, Leah Wright Rigur is an associate professor of public policy. Uh, her research expertise focuses on 20th century uh, U.S. history. Uh, including in particular modern African American history. Um, we really could not, uh, could not possibly ask for a better group of people to uh, teach us and engage with us today. Um, the discussion will be moderated by uh, Sarah Wald, uh, who's my chief of staff and also an adjunct lecturer at the Kennedy School and Harvard Law School. Sarah, please. Thank you very much to everyone who's attending today. I'm going to get right to our faculty panelists because that's what I think we all, who we all want to hear from. Just a quick uh, note on the format. First of all, we are recording this and um, it will be up on the public website in a few days. We're going to hear briefly from all of the panelists and then we will open it up for questions from the audience. If you would use your virtual hand raising, please. So, and um, I'll call on um, questioners. So we have um, today, as part of our um, series on, co on COVID-19 and various um, effects and ramifications, today's focus is on race and the pandemic. But as we will hear from our panelists later, there are several pandemics that are going on right now. As Cornell Brooks said, we have the COVID-19 pandemic and we have a pandemic of police violence and um, protests that stem from that. So we're gonna be talking pretty broadly today and uh, hope that your questions will follow up on some of that. So to start with, we're gonna have Professor Muhammad um, kind of set the stage um, for uh, the moment that we're in now. So, Khalil. Sure. Thank, thank you, Sarah, for the introduction and, and to uh, everyone who helped put this together. Uh, so, I have the great joy of offering some basic historical context for what Leah Cornell and Desmond will fill in. I think that uh, given the three minute time, time slot, it's best to essentially make uh, a claim. And that is that there's no aspect of US history that doesn't run through uh, the story of race and racism. And that any effort to uh, to determine such is itself part of the story of 400 years of erasing that central fact. Our political institutions were built uh, with the idea that chattel slavery had to be uh, incorporated one way or the other, had to be explained. The wealth of the nation itself was born uh, of the enterprise of both land theft and labor exploitation, of which as Obvious as this sounds to me, uh, must be repeated over and over again because it cuts against people's belief systems. And uh, for a school that was built to articulate applied knowledge, um, I think people do understand that belief systems are more powerful than data itself. And so one of those belief systems is that 
uh, racism is the problem of the idea of anti-blackness, um, not the problem of the organization of our society. But in fact, it's the other way around. Racism is the way that this society was organized to, to essentially extract from groups of people. Mostly those people uh, were of African descent in the context of chattel slavery for 250 years. Uh, but other groups came along and, and in various particular and regional contexts, including Asian Americans in the middle of the 19th century or Irish workers uh, also during the same time period, served the purpose just as well. Um, and so there's no American history that we could recover that lives outside of this basic fact. In which case, if, if you can accept that and people have a choice to make, but if they could accept that, then everything else begins to make sense for people whose purpose was to harness their labor capacity, um, it doesn't make sense that they should have uh, adequate health care uh, in the 19th century or any other century uh, in America. Uh, it doesn't make sense that they should be well-educated uh, to harness their uh, innate curiosities and talents uh, for the purposes of finding their passion in their profession. Um, and I could give you, I mean, again, in three minutes, I don't have time to walk through the case study, to the proof. I'll give you one example uh, on the education point. At the moment that African Americans were, uh, were literally free of the curse of slavery, um, some of the richest people in America got together, some of whom helped to endow great research universities like John D. Rockefeller, got together and they established something called the General Education Board. Um, many people understand the General Education Board as a wonderful effort by elites at the time to do right by the freedmen, to help build the schools for them. But in their own document, in their own stated purpose, um, similar to the document of the Confederacy of why they were seceding, right? if we go back to what they said this General Education Board was about doing, was about making sure that Black people would not become statesmen or philosophers, but making sure that they would have a rudimentary education so that they could be free laborers in an agricultural economy as sharecroppers to contribute to uh, the nation's economic work. And so they left slavery only to be put right back into a subordinated position, not because a bunch of people just didn't like them, but because that was the point of them being here in the first place. So I'm gonna stop with that because the evidence of the pandemic's toll is the accumulated divestment and disadvantages that have been attached to the diminished quality of Black people's lives from the very beginning. We like the exceptions. We like to tell the exceptional story. We like to tell the story of American exceptionalism. I had a call with the Trilateral Commission today, courtesy of Megan Sullivan in the Belfer Center, and a gentleman asked me about Obama. We haven't talked about Obama. You know, I looked at Obama and I thought to myself, if there was an Obama, how, could, how racist could America be? But America has been incredibly sophisticated at presenting its um, formerly enslaved to the world as evidence of its own greatness. Mm. Um, and that's not to diminish Barack Obama's talents or gifts. It, meant to, it is to say that part of what made Barack Obama possible was the redemptive narrative that white people like to tell themselves about how great America is. So you leave everybody else behind, the systems are intact, um, not much changes. Obama will never go down in history as being an anti-racist president or one that fought against systems of oppression on behalf of black people. He tinkered a bit uh, with the system, but, uh, and if I'm provoking people, that's terrific because in the provocation, there'll be some learning uh, and you can certainly disagree with me. So with that, I'm gonna take my, uh, my seat and hand it off to the next presenter. Well, thank you for that framing, for sure. Um, our next speaker is Leah, right? We're really going to pick up on some of these same themes, um, talk a little bit about the political situation and some of the health um, ramifications of the um, pandemic, too. Sure. So thank you, Sarah, for that. And, and it's really wonderful to see all of these people on this call right now. Um, and having these kind of conversations, which are just really valuable, I think, especially at a public policy school. And I'm going to come back to that public policy school uh, uh, kind of suggestion at the end in a second. But I also wanted to start off with a claim as well, which is a pretty simple claim, 
which is that COVID-19 has exposed a longer history of structural and institutional racism that has really battered Black America. And I don't think it's actually possible to understand a moment like we're in right now, particularly with the intersection of COVID-19 and the protests that we're seeing, for example, with George Floyd, uh, or spurred on or inspired by George Floyd in part, without understanding this longer history of racism and structural inequality and how they're intertwined and what they can produce and what they have produced. So there are a couple of things that I want to uh, point to, including that I think is useful for reference. Um, the first is the congressional testimony of Rhea Boyd, uh, who is a pediatrician who has also done, who did, I believe, a year at the Chan School, and then also a new Harvard Chan School study on racial disparities in COVID-19, because I think they're important for setting the stage for how we think about racial inequalities, racial disparities, and racial inequities. So just to give you kind of an idea, um, African Americans, these studies have found that African Americans are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. So they have much higher rates of death, both contracting the, uh, contracting the disease, but also uh, mortality rates. So if we think about it, uh, for example, about 17 and a half percent of African Americans are, or 17.5 percent of African Americans are dying of COVID-19. That's compared to 13 percent of the population, right? Um, another really high kind of comparative group, racial group, is thinking about 27.3 percent of Latino deaths compared to 18 percent of the population. So they are dying at a much higher rate than um, their actual proportion to the population. And with African Americans, this is especially salient because not only is it happening across the country, but in more than uh, uh, close to 50 states actually, uh, we see that the mor mortality rate for African Americans is exponential, it's extraordinary. Um, it's already, when we look across all racial groups, it's already 2.3 times the rate of the general population. So it's, I think this is important to point out, and it's also important to point out that this is holding true, not simply for elderly or older populations, which has kind of been the narrative around COVID-19, but the Chan School study in particular has now shown that it's also consistent across age groups. So younger African Americans have higher, much higher mortality rates. I believe the uh, percentage uh, is seven point times percent higher than the rest of the population, right? So we're now seeing this cross across uh, uh, age groups and affect these populations. So I think this is in part why it's um, important to focus on the structural aspects and this larger history, right? So there's been no great health crisis in this country that hasn't hit black Americans disproportionately harder than the rest of the country. And I'm thinking about, for example, the Spanish flu, but I'm also thinking about a more insidious and deliberate history. For example, thinking about things like the Tuskegee experiment, which I'm happy to talk about. And I'm sure several of the panels are happy to talk about during the Q and A or thinking about black maternal health disparities and inequities, right? Black women are more than three times, have three times the mortality rate than other racial groups in this country when it comes to black maternal health rates. So when we, sit, so when we kind of look at something like um, COVID-19, part of what we're seeing with the structural aspects is that da uh, black Americans are now in, because of structural and institutional racism, are actually positioned in this larger, uh, this larger system where they are disproportionately affected by COVID-19 disease and health crises. So they work, for example, in service industries that have sustained public contact, like hospitality, transportation, the health industries. They also have less access to critical worker protections, such as paid sick leave, uh, equitable wages, you know, things like that. And then also when we think about something like residential segregation, which a lot of people have tried to disaggregate from COVID-19, you can't actually disaggregate those things because historically African-Americans have been pushed into spaces to reside in spaces that have denser urban, you know, denser, uh, denser population um, in urban areas that also increase and add to the risk for COVID-19. Right? Um, one other point that I thought was wor uh, worth looking at is that we see an overrepresentation amongst homeless and home ins insecure populations, right? So it's connected to these questions of affordable housing, fair housing, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's this longer history, particularly as we think about protest, that actually really complements this larger crisis in with race and COVID-19. And I just wanna use one quick example, which is to look at the 1960s. So by the 1960s, we're actually seeing a sea change of things, of action happening in large part thanks to say the civil rights protests that are sweeping the nation. And I think uh, uh, Professor Muhammad brought this up, right? That there are all of these kind of things which may feel like they're significant changes, but instead what we actually see when we look under the surface is that uh, it also triggers um, these larger systemic uh, kind of uh, 
uh, feelings that feelings of rage and anger that are triggered by systemic inequalities that are not addressed by the civil rights protests or civil rights changes or actions that we see happening. So we see the rise, for example, of rebellion and riots. And part of it, when we look at the underlying conditions, are that there are higher health mortality rates. The quality of life and living is declining amongst African Americans. We also see, for example, a longer history of hostility and police brutality that is in, directly connected to some of these mortality rates. And so what we see is that people are reacting to institutional and structural racism that is embedded in their life experience. Uh, experience. So I wanna close by bringing this around and bringing, thinking about how, say, something like the protest that we're seeing is actually connected directly to COVID-19. And I would argue that there's a direct correction in a number of ways. The first is that part of why we can't look away from something like George Floyd or the symbolism of George Floyd's murder at the hands of state-sanctioned act actors is that COVID-19 has quarantined us. So we quite literally cannot look away. But also, part of what George Floyd symbolizes is this larger question of racial inequities and disparities that we have in our society. So I want to point out, right, well, part of what we see with uh, George Floyd is that he has COVID-19 in his lungs when he's killed by the police. And part of that points to the failures of the American healthcare system and the repeated Christ health crises that disproportionately target and affect Black people, right? So I think this kind of twin sense of pandemic within a uh, pandemic in terms of racism and pandemic in terms of kind of viral health disparities is really important. And it's really important, particularly as we think about the failures of these larger state sanctioned systems and the failures of democracy. And so I'll end by saying, you know, this is particularly important that we have this conversation at a public policy school, because the larger question is thinking about how these kind of historical and continuing failures actually reflect on us, right? So how have we continued to fail in terms of public policy, public officials, and public institutions, particularly in intervening in the crises of Black people, and in this uh, case, particularly the crisis of COVID-19? So I will stop there, and I will turn it over to Desmond. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, picking, uh, continuing some of the themes about, particularly about police violence, um, Desmond. Yeah. Thank you, Doug and, and Sarah, for having me and for everyone else for being here. Uh, obviously, this is a very serious and somber issue, uh, but I'm personally very thrilled to be here uh, and to join much more esteemed colleagues to Leo, Leah, and to, know, uh, to learn from their expertise. Uh, so as Sarah mentioned, my own work is around police violence. Um, and one thing that I think uh, this pandemic has really brought into stark relief is just how differently different communities and neighborhoods are policed. Uh, so you guys might recall uh, the headlines in New York City a month ago about how essentially the vast majority of people who were arrested for violating social distancing orders were Black. Um, at the same time, there were sort of videos circulating showing hordes of sort of white sunbathers sitting together in parks without masks um, in very public places. Uh, more recently, we've seen images of NYPD officers refusing to wear masks uh, at Black Lives Matter protests. And, uh, you know, this is an issue not just about, you know, blacks and whites from the same neighborhood being different, treated differently by individual police officers, this type of sort of individual discrimination that economists tend to focus on, uh, but rather it's driven by the fact that law enforcement as an institution just looks completely differently. It looks completely different when you go from one neighborhood to another, when you go from white neighborhood to black neighborhood. Uh, and to be clear, this is often explicitly by design, as Lou was mentioning. Uh, so there's this quote from Michael Bloomberg a few years back explaining his stop and frisk strategy in New York, where he essentially says, you know, people are saying, oh, my God, why are you arresting kids for marijuana who are all minorities? This is uh, in quotes. He says, yes, that's true. Why? Because we put all the cops in the minority neighborhood to essentially throw kids against the wall and frisk them. And so this is how you get someone like George Floyd getting his neck kneeled on for eight minutes for using a counterfeit bill or someone like Eric Garner being put in a chokehold for selling cigarettes. Right. This type of thing is by design. It just doesn't happen in other types of neighborhoods, neighborhoods where blacks don't reside. Right. And so I'm pretty sure I can sell as many cigarettes as I want in Brookline. Uh, there's pretty much no world in which I end up getting put in a chokehold, much less killed. And so as Khalil discussed uh, in some of his other work, you know, this double standard goes back decades. In, in 1968, the Turner Commission, um, which is put together by LBJ, reported, and I quote, on the widespread belief among African Americans in the existence of police brutality and the double standard of justice and protection. You'll find essentially the exact same sentiments expressed in the early 1900s after the Chicago riots, in the mid-1900s after the Harlem riots, 
after the Rodney King riots in the 1990s, after the Ferguson riots in 2014. And so, you know, we've seen, we're having this national discussion now about race, about policing. And I think a lot of people were sort of just coming to the topic. They're thinking, what's different? What's actually changed? Why is this happening? And honestly, you know, if you look at the record, nothing's different, nothing's changed, except now that people are paying attention. So every year in the United States, there are a thousand police killings a year. Uh, this number is uh, essentially constant as far back as we have data. Uh, and about half of these events involve Blacks and Hispanics. About half of those involve individu individuals that weren't armed with a gun. Uh, so essentially, a lot of events that sound a whole lot like George Floyd, a lot of events that sound a whole lot like Michael Brown. Uh, and so these things have been going on for a really long time. Minority communities have just essentially had to silently bear it. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there aren't consequences. In my own research, I find that, you know, after police kill someone, Black and Hispanic students in those neighborhoods experience, you know, pretty significant decreases in the GPA, increased incidence of something called emotional disturbance, which is correlated with PTSD. Uh, these students actually report feeling less safe in their neighborhoods after police killings, which is essentially the exact opposite of the purpose of law enforcement. Uh, and these effects are, you know, most drastic if the person that was killed is an unknown mi minority, which I think gets to a lot of Leah's points, which is that there are these underlying concerns about justice and fairness among many minority communities. They come to a head after these events happen, uh, but that's been happening over a very long period of time. Uh, and ultimately estimate that each police killing in one county that I examined caused about three students of color to drop out of high school. That's each police killing. Uh, and so these events matter, they seem to matter for how people see themselves, how they think society views them, what they think is possible for themselves. And, you know, it's going to be hard to measure all of these effects, but we can measure some. And what we do know paints a pretty dire picture, that this is essentially a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Police are being sent by design to poor minority neighborhoods. They're killing people there, children are traumatized, they're dropping out of school, and then the cycle repeats itself. And so we have new research now coming out uh, by economists like Raj Chetty and others. Uh, that shows that the black-white income gap is not going to close itself. They estimate that, you know, if we, leave the, if we leave things as they are, our children, our children's children are going to face very similar racial disparities as exist today, like things aren't just going to get better over time. Uh, and based on my work and that of others, there's increasing evidence that policing, systemic racism, et cetera, has a really large role to play in this, right? So obviously, this is a really harsh reality for a lot of us to confront, uh, particularly being part of the ivory tower, where we're very insulated from the world, as well as during this pandemic where it's really easy to feel powerless. Uh, that being said, I, I am hopeful that things can change. You know, the conversation has shifted a lot, as you know, exemplified by the fact that we're even having this discussion now. Uh, we've seen polling showing that public support for Black Lives Matter has increased rapidly. Um, and I think, you know, greater awareness of systemic racism, our complicity in it is obviously not enough to fix anything, but hopefully it's a necessary step uh, towards doing so. Uh, and I'm very glad to be part of the community with people like Cornell, uh, who know better what the next steps uh, after that are. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to him. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Desmond. And finally, for this portion, um, Cornell Brooks is going to continue the discussion of the uh, multiple pandemics and um, what it looks like from some of the uh, on the ground. Sure, sure. Yeah. So first of all, let me just begin with a, a word of appreciation to, uh, to, to Sarah, um, to the staff for making time for this important discussion, uh, and certainly to uh, my colleagues who do so much to help us better understand um, systemic racism and both pandemics in terms of the pandemic of COVID-19 and the pandemic of police brutality. What I'd like to lift up in but a few moments is the relationship between COVID-19 and police brutality as a matter of advocacy. So I come to the relationship, uh, exploring this relationship between these two pandemics as an expression of systemic racism uh, as a professor of practice. And specifically looking at these instances of police brutality informed by the experience of um, working on investigations, litigation, marches, demonstration, um, legislative advocacy in the context of Eric Garner in New York, uh, Walter uh, Scott in Charleston, Laquan McDonald in Chicago, Alton Sterling in Louisiana, uh, Jordan Edwards uh, in Dallas, Tamir Rice uh, in Cleveland, and so many others. 
when we think about the uh, pandemic of police misconduct and the pandemic of COVID-19, there may be those who look at these two pandemics as an expression of systemic racism and look at the latter, namely police brutality, uh, is as uh, perhaps not being a pandemic at all. Uh, we, not, we need not make the assumption that everyone understands that, particularly when we compare the fatalities of the two. So when it comes to COVID-19, uh, well over 100,000 uh, mortalities, over 200 million, I should say 2 million infections, compared to 1,000 people who lose their lives at the hands of the police each and every year. Uh, these pandemics differ in scale. But with respect to racial disparities, the disparities are, are, are stark. So when it comes to police misconduct, if we think about the fact that a young black man is 21 times more likely to lose his life at the hands of the police than his white counterpart. When we think about the fact that uh, the average black man, as it were, uh, is three times more likely to lose his life at the hands of the police, and that the sixth leading cause of death among young black men is police homicide. So these pandemics differ in scale, but with respect to racial disparities, the disparities are stark and unsettling uh, and disturbing. And when we go to uh, Leah's point in terms of the relationship between these uh, pandemics, let's think about the ways in which we talk about these pandemics. So there's a lead article uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine focused on COVID-19 uh, by Merlin Chuckwine and Owen and Adolph Reed. And they lift up the ways in which we talk about the pandemic of COVID-19 and offer context and caution. Uh, context in terms of, and caution with respect to biologic explanations of COVID-19, behavioral uh, explanations of COVID-19, and territorial stigmatization with respect to COVID-19. So in other words, when we talk about these racial disparities, there's a temptation with respect to COVID-19 to, to offer up uh, biologic explanations. Uh, the, the respiratory systems of African Americans are different. The bodies of Black people are different. And this somehow explains these racial uh, disparities. Uh, this is not unlike what happens in the context of discussions of, of police brutality. Uh, namely, there's something uh, unique, distinctive about uh, Black bodies. We know as a, as a matter of uh, any number of, of studies that uh, folks in the public health uh, arena, uh, in, uh, the, in the arena of medicine, believe that uh, black bodies can withstand more pain. Uh, police officers certainly act as though black bodies can withstand more pain. There's this notion that somehow uh, black bodies are in fact different. Uh, if we go to the second point of behavioral explanations of the novel coronavirus. Uh, the notion that racial disparities, ethnic disparities, class disparities can be explained by the behavior of the victims. Uh, going back to any number of public health challenges in the past, when we look at uh, migrant communities, immigrant communities, we'll blame it on, uh, on crowded living conditions, uh, unsanitary living conditions, the unhygienic ha habits of those in migrant communities and immigrant communities. Uh, such as the case with African Americans. But this is not only true with respect to uh, COVID-19, but it's also true with, with, with respect to police brutality, that there's, somehow, there's something about the behavior of the victims of police brutality that explains their victimization. So we have discussions about how do we police communities with high crime, as opposed to how do we police uh, communities and communities of color. The notion, the assumption being that with certain communities, uh, we can do things that we don't do in other communities, as Desmond has alluded to. So for example, when we look at the scholarship of, of Tracy Mears at Yale Law School, and she talks about the fact that we think about policing as, um, as a utility, uh, a cost uh, the cost of which is born across society. So in other, in other words, for us to have public safety, everyone has to bear some of that cost. But when it comes to black communities because of their behavior, brown communities because of their behavior, 
uh, they bear more of the cost with respect to a loss of civil liberties. They bear more of a cost with respect to civil rights. They bear more of a cost with respect to the loss of life, and that's expected. This is a, a part of the cost of doing business. So stop and frisk with all of its unconstitutional, immoral uh, ramifications and devastation at the community level. The assumption was for many years that this is something that we have to do, a cost that must be borne in order to ensure public safety. In New York City, for example, a public safety across the city, but born by black and communities in particular, all explained by their behavior. Last point here, when we think about COVID-19, the scholars warn us about territorial stigmatization. This notion that when we talk about racial disparities, ethnic disparities, uh, and we drill down with the data, we get granular with, with the data uh, at the neighborhood level, it can unwittingly stigmatize certain communities. So when we think about the, the fact that yeah, in this country, uh, the uh, onset of the coronavirus um, was borne heavily by New York City in communities of color. Those communities were unwillingly stigmatized. So in other words, it's about the black and brown they, not the multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-class us. And so as we describe the problem in terms of the coronavirus and the pandemic of policing, we see the same rationale offered up to explain the victimization of the victims. Last point here, which is as, as a professor of practice teaching advocacy, I think it's critically important for us to not discuss the disparities without discussing the context. In other words, going to the root of systemic racism talking about policing not as a matter of technocratic tinkering around the edges, but literally transforming policing from, from top to bottom, dealing with the fact that the whole enterprise is infected with racism and the expression of systemic racism in our society. If we talk about racial disparities without talking about racial causes, longstanding, historically rooted, we both misunderstand must misunderstand, misstate, and underprescribe the solution to the problem. So with that said, I look forward to uh, the discussion. Thank you so much, Cornell. Thank you to all of our panelists. A lot to think about. So would people, uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand virtually. And uh, um, let me see, we're not getting any questions yet. People must have questions. Well, um, let's see, question from Fiona Marwa. Um, thank, thank you for such an um, insightful conversation. I'm from Uganda. One of the things as you're speaking, I'm trying to figure out how can we draw lessons from Rwanda, from, the, from South Africa, the Truth and Reconciliation Com Commission. What is it that has worked for South Africa or that has worked for Rwanda? that we could draw from a public policy perspective uh, to help us move beyond the conversation and dealing with systemic, the systemic challenges. Thank you. Well, anyone can answer, but I did notice that Cornell was in the news uh, clips this morning talking about truth and reconciliation, time for truth and reconciliation. So why don't you start, Cornell? Sure. So uh, thank you for uh, a wonderful question. When we look at the South African uh, example uh, in terms of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we look at the uh, challenge of policing in this country. So namely 18,000 police departments, over 19,000 jurisdictions with a prevailing philosophy at philosophical response of, we have to deal with a few bad apples. Well, if we deal with a few bad apples across 18,000 police departments, 19,000 jurisdictions, we literally have to go uh, life by life, hashtag by hashtag over the course of many years to begin to address the problem as opposed to comprehending and grappling with the totality of the problem deeply rooted in systemic racism. So one of the uh, responses I advocate uh, along with Alan uh, Kazai, uh, a friend of the Kennedy School is the use of a truth, justice and reconciliation commission. The point being is Congress allocating $50 million to hold hearings 
uh, at the national level, in Congress, field hearings all across the, the country in the same way that the George Floyd protests are in 50 states as well as around the world. We need to take the protest stories, protest narratives on the streets uh, and really take them to Congress and around the country. Why? Because as we look at the prospect and possibility of a second wave, um, how long can we sustain so many people being in the streets? Uh, having led marches and demonstrations, this exacts a toll on communities that have to tell their stories over and over again. We need the federal government to pay for a curation of stories so that we build the national will to address the problem at the local level, across 18,000 police departments and 19,000 jurisdictions, as well as the national level. So national legislation as well as local legislation over an arc of time, which allows us to sustain and create a sense of urgency, but also maintain a sense of momentum. Unless we do that, based upon my experience in Ferguson uh, and elsewhere, literally, we burn the advocates out, we burn the activists out, we burn the, philanthrop the philanthropists out uh, without getting the kind of reform that we need, and we literally miss this moment. So that, that would be my argument, uh, advocacy. Leah, Khalil, Desmond, do you have anything to add? I, I'll just add something quickly. Um, so one of the things that makes truth and reconciliation work in other places is that uh, essentially the U.S. and in some cases other Western liberal democracies um, put pressure on those other places <laughs> to have these commissions that actually have teeth and um, are the conditions upon which these countries can emerge uh, back on the world stage. And so the U.S. has been beating its chest as a singular power for more than a century, refuses to abide a lot of U.N. resolutions that would uh, take international standards and apply them in our own country. And so while I agree with Cornell, a certain amount of truth and reconciliation is necessary, we have a pretty good history of versions of that with these commission reports. Kerner would be one of them. Bill Clinton uh, held a, a one on race in uh, Durban, South, Carolina, uh, South Africa in 2001. Um, and so we have a political problem that racism um, itself actually uh, has a benefit to our political marketplace. Um, it doesn't always look the same. It certainly doesn't always sound the same, but a version of anti-blackness or disciplining the poor, particularly the black poor, um, it's, it's not gonna be solved by a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, I would argue that it will be solved when our professional schools like Harvard, Kennedy School, or all universities center the problem of race and racism in, its, in their curriculum, um, because we're literally systematically miseducating uh, our own population and even visitors to this country about why we're so great and why we shouldn't pay attention to what other countries uh, are doing if it challenges our own norms. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll just jump in. I wanna add one thing quickly. I think one of the important things about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the subsequent way in which South Africa has handled some of these things is that they have put their money where their mouths are. And they have essentially treated this problem of apartheid and things coming out of apartheid as if it, you know, essentially it matters and that they must rectify the wrong that has been done. So the first part of that is there's an acknowledgement that wrong was done. And it's something that everyone has to agree on in order for us to move forward. The next step though, was the federal policy making. And I think this is what Khalil and uh, Cornell were getting at, is that there is a robust po public policy reaction and response and investment into the solutions that have come out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So even right now, we are having hearings on police, quote unquote, reform, and we're having hearings on racial disparities in health uh, in Congress. And as of right now, it doesn't necessarily look like any teeth are gonna be behind those commissions, right? So they'll, they'll, they'll be left there as, well, here's a nice document of, of things that have happened. The difference, one of the, and I mean, this is still the thing with South Africa today, the difference is they put policies into action that was designed to rectify past harm. We still can't even get a commission together going on reparations. So I think one of the things that we have to deal with is what are the kinds of policies that 
you know, the United States actually would have to put in place and then act on in, in, in terms of invest in these various communities and these various problems. And so far, we have not been able to do that. Yes, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think, uh, I think my colleagues have really covered most of the things. Right, the next question is Bandalark Patricks. Well, you have to unmute yourself. Bandalark, or you unmuted? Are you getting me now? Yes, now we are. Okay, thank you. So um, I listened to the panelists and uh, it's really not a question, but I think it's a concern. You know, when we look at the, the action of the police, especially in the context of the American society, this series of concerns, especially where, you know, black people in the United States or African-American, whatever, you know, they have been treated in terms of the action carried on them by the police. It makes me to contemplate on a few things. Uh, we are aware America is uh, one of those sophisticated societies, and in terms of dealing with the um, issue of governance, I'm concerned about how officers are recruited, because uh, if we have a lot of college graduates you know, being recruited in the police force. In my mind, they will be able to deal with the citizens because the society is getting sophisticated on a daily basis. But imagine a police officer who is not a college graduate who has spent maybe less than six months on the training academy, and uh, he's giving gun, he's giving counsels of necessary materials to go and enforce law. He goes on the street, he meets somebody that is well sophisticated and with the laws of the United States of America. He understands the content, how the police are supposed to conduct themselves. And that individual citizen decides to remind this police officer who is not even aware about their rules and responsibilities. And it becomes a problem because the police officer feels humiliated and he has a gun. So in my mind, we have to look at the fundamental issues to go to the curriculum to see as to whether those who are recruited in the police have that mental capacity to digest the contents within the curriculum. Because if you have people who don't understand what they're supposed to do or to really understand their responsibility, it becomes a problem. So for me, I think in order to minimize the series of violations that are carried against people, we must begin to look at the caliber of people that are recruited in the police force, and uh, they will be able to deal with a sophisticated society because in my mind, if somebody who has a college degree is enforcing law and order, he understands the contents of the training manual, I think he will be more professional in dealing with the citizens as compared to somebody who is just trained for six months or even a year to go in force. So for me, I see that as a problem. I think we need to look at that. Thank you. Leo, and you have a response. You know what? I, I want to I I I pass the mic to, to Desmond on this. I want to hold back because I know, I know he hasn't responded yet. And I'd, I'd be interested in hearing. I do have a response, but I want to okay. share the wealth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Leah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I don't know if a college degree is, is really necessarily the, the prerequisite that, you know, determines whether or not someone would be a good uh, police officer or not. Um, I do know that, you know, in, in some of my research, the way that we recruit police officers is uh, somewhat strange. So in one county, the county that I studied, when I first started looking at the county, you know, I went to the police officer, the, you know, the police academy's website, and, you know, the, the first, the bold headline there wasn't like, do you want to serve your county? Do you want to serve your community? It was, you know, the starting salary is this much money, right? And, you know, you can imagine that is uh, a good recruiting tool to get maybe highly qualified people to get, you know, like any job, it's, it's good to have um, competitive benefits. Um, but that's maybe, again, not the, not the criteria that we want to be recruiting officers on. Uh, more generally, I think that there, there's an issue in terms of um, 
structure within police departments and guidelines within police departments. So even if you are recruiting someone that, you know, maybe has a college background, maybe doesn't have a background, there are sort of, there should be at least, I would imagine, uh, guidelines for when you should use force, when you shouldn't use force, like what the department stands for, et cetera. There have been numerous reports by the federal government, et cetera, showing that this is just incredibly lacking, right? And so that what ends up happening is that there's this culture of whatever the local culture is among your police officers, maybe a us versus them mentality develops. Uh, rather than there being any type of sort of systematic or, or institutional guidelines around, you know, th these are sort of the norms or the ethics that we have uh, in our community. Uh, more generally, I think that there's research um, by Phil Joff showing that, um, you know, oftentimes some of these police uh, encounters occur because, uh, you know, we're recruiting people that have chips on their shoulders to be police officers. Uh, once their masculinity gets threatened, this machismo kicks in and they feel like they need to kill somebody. Uh, and so, you know, again, these are not the criteria that we want to be uh, recruiting people on. I don't know specifically, you know, what correlates with the type of person that we want. Uh, but I think currently the, the system is clearly somewhat problematic. Yeah. And then, so, yeah. yeah, so I'm just going to jump in here and say that there's this statistic that's been floating around that I think is actually really important for this discussion, which is that of the of the police uh, uh, police institutions that have been involved in excessive use of force, violence, and shootings, roughly 80% of them have undergone training and reform and education. Minneapolis had undergone all of that, and yet here we are. So I think part of this part of this is this with this assumption that by simply instituting kind of simple reforms, that we'll get this new kind of system of policing. But instead, what I think we're trying to tell you here and what a number of scholars and, and Khalil writes about this extensively in his book, but what a number of scholars have pointed out is that you're, what, what we actually need to be focusing on is the system itself and the system and how it is created. So the other thing that we find too, for example, one of the suggestions that has been tossed out is that we should have people uh, from the community or we should have more black people, more representation on the force, right? Along with these ideas of education and things like that. But actually what we find is that it, the culture itself is the problem. So you can integrate and make those changes and you're still gonna to have, to Desmond's point, the same uses of excessive use of force, police shootings, extra you know, uh, uh, killings and things like that. So instead, I think part of what we're trying to get at is that we actually have to reimagine the entire system in and of itself rather than, reima rather than reimagining different parts of it. Right? This is from the ground up, essentially, rebuilding, reimagining, reinventing. I know some people on here are very much part of uh, defunding, but really rethinking how we do policing in this country, because the way that policing has been done in this country, including the culture, is very much anti-Black and rooted in anti-Blackness. And no amount of education or, educate, or educated individuals is going to fix that. Yeah, yeah I'll make this really quick. Um... I think that, uh, I think it was Cornell who referenced Bloomberg's, uh, or no, it was Desmond who, who referenced Bloomberg's defense of, of stop and frisk. So um, it wouldn't matter how much of an education a person has if the police approach to crime control and crime prevention is the daily abuse and indignity um, of the citizens of communities. I mean, so uh, you, you might have someone who's very intelligent and sophisticated, you might not, but they're all following the same rule book. The quick second point is that um, there is so much uh, anti-intellectualism baked into the political culture of the United States, whereby going to college for a significant number of Republican elites and their supporters, um, college is a, a place where white people get to learn about racism and that's a bad thing and so you shouldn't go to college. <laughs> Um, and so it's, it's a remarkable thing that there is one, at least one political party in this country that believes that college is a source of anti-Americanness, um, which of course the police unions are themselves representative of a working class white male ethos uh, that are most vulnerable to this kind of deliberate miseducation. Um, and propaganda that exists uh, in this society. So, Ralph, yeah. So I, I agree with with, with my colleagues. Um, going to this point of reimagining uh, policing, uh, 
it goes to the gravity and the magnitude of the problem here. As, 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 as Khalil has lifted up and Desmond has lifted up, it's not a matter of tinkering around the edges. It's not a matter of having uh, better educated uh, officers because, uh, and as Lee has lifted up, across the board, these police departments have gone through uh, training. Uh, many of us called for that training. Uh, many of us called for the body cameras, assuming that the technology meant accountability, and it did not. The point being here is we've got to recognize the, the historical sweep of the problem, going back to the slave patrols, uh, appreciate the magnitude of the problem, the sheer carnage, the fact that we had more people killed in a month than some countries have in the entire year. This uh, does not suggest literally uh, getting a couple of uh, college credits. And again, I'll, I'll close with Khalil's point. The people who administered these programs were extraordinarily well-educated. Right? Uh, all of this in stop and frisk, uh, validated by untold number of stories, which really resu resulted in literally the brutalization and the daily indignities uh, that people suffered uh, for years on it, uh, after litigation. So. Thank you. Um, next question, Brian Hi, thank you so much um, for having this conversation. Um, I think my question follows along on what folks are talking about here. Um, this question of abolishing the police, defunding the police versus reform. Um, I know that for me, I'm from a very white liberal community and a lot of the conversations that I'm hearing um, seem very different than what has been ha happened before, which is both exciting to see um, but I think that I'm seeing a lot of tension between calling for reform in a way that seems acceptable to the mainstream public and like therefore maybe more likely to get passed versus actually calling for the abolition of the police force, defunding the police force. Um, and I know that like Khalil has talked a lot about how the origins of the police are in these like slave patrols, like the origins are in themselves racist. Um, but it seems like reform and these kind of actions on the margins are more feasible. Um, so I'm wondering kind of where you guys see going from here um, and what's achievable versus what is kind of ideal, if that makes sense. Thank you so much. Well, Cornell, you want to take that? Sure. I'll, just, I'll just start. Um, Joanna, I, I, I'd ask you to consider um, a, a, an example and a precedent in our backyard. So Harvard, of course, is in Massachusetts. We go back a generation ago uh, where children were warehoused in reformatory schools, in reform schools. Uh, Jerome Miller, the commissioner of um, Department of Youth Services, not only defunds, but depopulates the schools first, takes the children out of the reform schools, puts them into group homes. He depopulates the reform schools, then subsequently defunds the, the reform schools and moves closer to a group home model. Massachusetts, a um, blue state. Missouri, around the same time frame, largely moves to a, a group home model. If you look at the literature in terms of youth recidivism, um, juvenile incarceration, we've cut the juvenile incarceration rate notwithstanding the fact that the racial disparities remain ugly and the same by 60%, okay? 50% roughly in the last 10 years. The point being here is not no, no cause for celebration, but certainly an example, practical, relatively recent, plenty of data to suggest that when the advocates call for uh, defunding the police uh, as a concept, this cannot be categorically dismissed. And so the point being here is when 60 year old donors in red and blue states essentially in various ways call for defunding prisons because they're too expensive and contribute to recidivism, we don't dismiss that. But when 19 year olds on the street posit, you know, posit the notion that we need to rethink policing, that's considered uh, per se inconceivable. And so I, I would simply encourage you 
to just think about what is happening in our backyard, look clinically, look objectively at what's been done around the country to create the moral possibility, the analytic space to seriously consider what's possible. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, I think people have been thinking about this uh, out loud and I'll just uh, remind folks that uh, we've watched uh, essentially a coalition of uh, Democrats and Republicans, uh, liberal elites and centrists in this country dismantle public education vis-a-vis -vis charter school movements. And in city after city, they've essentially shut down entire schools, uh, sometimes firing the entire school system and systematically uh, ripping out the collective bargaining agreements only then to hire back people who are on board with the new, <laughs> the new school plan. So um, it goes without saying uh, that technocrats have all the tools in the toolbox to be able to do whatever they want to do when it comes to dismantling entrenched systems. Um, my politics obviously are critical of such things, but it's not for lack of a process that we already know works. Uh, despised groups um, can be targeted for anything. Uh, police officers happen to be literally defined in this country uh, by custom as a protected class. And in some states, by virtue of Blue Lives Matter laws, are now actually fall under hate crime statute because somehow being a cop means you were born uh, with some kind of uh, special uh, gift that needs to be protected uh, from, uh, from citizens who object to you. Of course, it's an absurdity. Blue is not a shade of humanity. Yeah. So I'll add, um, I'll add one quick thing just to say, um, I'm optimistic and I think many people on this call probably are optimistic about the possibilities of reform, right? We have the, we have a, a democratic proposed bill. Uh, we just have a, had a Republican bill introduced. I actually don't think the conversation should be about reform because reform is going to happen. And in fact, I think if you've been looking at this and watching this, We've seen that reform has been happening for the past decade, at the very least, if not before then. I mean, one of the things that had come out has come out about Campaign Zero, which several of the, the, the members resigned this week, is that they put out a variety of suggestions about reform, come to find out all of those reforms have already passed. So I think the idea that, you know, we're not going to get reform out of this, or maybe that should be part of the conversation, I think we need to move beyond that and begin having a conversation about how reform hasn't worked. And so when you begin having a conversation, instead of allowing the conversation to pivot, okay, we need reform, we need reform, we need reform, and instead saying, well, we've had reform. We have reform right now. We are going to get more reform. But we've seen each and every time that that reform has not actually solved the problem, that that begins to move the conversation in a direction about what do we actually mean about reimagining policing and reimagining the police. And then the last thing I'll say here is that this is actually why activism on the ground protests is so vital because they've actually moved the conversation from the margins to the center and they've done it in a very very short period of time and they've done it in a way that is deeply convincing i mean there's more convincing that needs to be done but this is why it's particularly important to pay attention and i think as khalil pointed out we've defunded a whole lot of other institutions right a whole lot of other institutions we didn't have this conversation when it came to planned parenthood but when it comes to policing, now all of a sudden everything's off duty. And I think part of, what, uh, uh, part of what we need to be talking about is how, in fact, no, this is not off limits. And we need to have a very serious conversation about what reimagining, reinventing, you know, the police actually looks like in this moment. Yes, Matt, do you want to yeah, comment? Just, just to build off of what everyone else has said, you know, this is not a new issue that we've been having uh, and there have been talks of reform before and you know we've had you know during the report we've had other reports uh, as others have mentioned uh, and so to the extent that there are sort of entrenched issues with the, with the system like I feel like we need to we at least need to be open to, to the possibility of anything um, but I do want to say sort of on a more optimistic note that you know what is what's feasible uh, and I think we often have I often have, think of this as an economist like what is politically feasible what's not you know, all of these things are endogenous in econ speak, which says that, which just means that, you know, we, we have some control over what's feasible or not, right? Um, and we've seen in a very short period of time, as Leah was mentioning, this huge shift in terms of what the conversation is, how people feel about things like Black Lives Matter, right? Like a year ago, two years ago, Colin Kaepernick was blackballed by the NFL. Uh, 
now people are calling him a hero even within the same institution, right? And, and so all of these things I think are within the realm of possibility. And I think uh, it can often be sort of a limiting, we're sort of limiting our perspective and limiting sort of uh, the realm of possibility for us to, to think within these set parameters of saying something is or is not possible uh, ex ante uh, when we are sort of in control of what's going on. Thank you. Our next question, John Ding. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Ding. Um, from South Sudan, um, an incoming Edward Marsden uh, fellow. Uh, this issue of race is really taken center stage in my thought for the last uh, six months since I paid attention to issues in the United States. Um, I'm, I come from South Sudan. Of course, we are tall and among the darkest skinned people in the world. And to me, I left my country when I was about eight years, and the issue of skin has never occurred to me as something that makes me less equal or more superior than any other person. Uh, until I went to the UK, and I was in the UK for about two years, but really never occurred to me that I was somehow endangered because I was dark skin. But then when I started looking at issues in the United States of America, wow, I, I got a little bit shocked because for once, uh, I'm, I, I was considering at some point, you know, going to stay at the United, in the United States, but to what I've seen, I, I would not want my child to grow in such an environment where the color of his skin is, matters more than what he or she is capable of doing. However, uh, that is reaction. But then thinking about it and what can someone bring on board about the issue? Uh, I've seen people talking about it, form, funding the police, you know, structuring, the police, I do not think uh, it will answer to the concerns in the US. Because I tend to think that this thing is deep seated, it is cultural, it is a bad conversation about, um, among, among Americans. Because I have seen in, a, in that unfortunate death of George uh, Floyd, there are some people who are pushing back, thinking that, you know, that, uh, you know, we watch it on the screen here in Africa, we have never seen that in the world, personally speaking. And I would be very worried my own child watching it on the screen. So somehow, even within the United States of America, yes, I could see there even some voices talking against what has happened. And if you look at essence, the way that person cried out, any soul would be touched and you feel guilty about it. So I think it is a cultural issue. Americans need to talk, need to accept, as I put it earlier on, the people have to accept that your history has a lot of loopholes that needs to be something went wrong in the formation of America at a certain stage. And that must be acknowledged by, by, by the United States of America as a society, that something is wrong within our structures and we'll never be at peace as long as we don't admit to this that has happened and look at the way of addressing it without necessarily letting black people seem as if they are on the receiving end of affirmative action. Because again, on the other hand, it doesn't help to say, you know, because there, was a, there were historical injustices you got to get this for free and the other. No, all that is ha has to happen is that for children to grow up accepting each other and knowing that all of you have equal opportunities in America and that no one should in any way be disadvantaged because of where he or she comes from or how he looks like. That dis discussion, I have not seen it happen because in the UK, people are very sensitive to the issues of race. And I think in the UK, the moment you seem to be a bit racial in your reference, you, you are seen as if you're backwards. And so no one would want really to be proud about how, the, how different he or she is from the other person, apart from you know, the ideas and, and, and what you do for a living and how you behave. So ideally speaking, America has to, go, has to come to terms with that. To know that you know, if, by looking, by judging someone on the basis of his or her skill, a skill actually tells of how much you don't even know about the world because I come from South Sudan, I live in Kenya, one of those places that is known for corruption, but I will never be worried about a Kenyan corruption the way uh, Kenyan police, meeting Kenyan police at night, the way I would be more worried about meeting American police at night, not even at night, during the day. And on the other side, uh, to the black community, for example, I, I have watched some clips with a lot of keenness. Yes, it is understandable that people have lived under suffering for too long, you become emotional, you become reactive. So, with some sort of provocation, people sometimes play into the hands of the police, and police takes advantage of that. 
So it is also has to be, there has to be a conversation within the black community. You know, the moment you are told you are protected, but you should not also pl overplay your rights to the extent that you play into the hand of these law enforcing agencies, because at the end of the day, they are a public authority. You got to respect them. And even if you are wrongly arrested, you rather surrender, and then later, you know, fight for your rights rather than actually creating, first of all, you are endangering your life. Secondly, you are even, uh, you know, creating more notion that, you know, black people are violent and therefore they should be met with violence. So it has, it is double edge. It's a double sword that, you know, as, as much as we expect white people on the other side to accept that there's nothing different about them or there's nothing inferior about being born black, the black people also have to struggle to overcome their own emotions and you know, historical injustices and try to not to confirm some of the, some of the stories that are told to children that you know black are dangerous and they pass by you know they are likely to hurt you say that you know it works both way but then our institutions can come to harmonize this so i tend to think it is a cultural issue that needs societal discussion among itself within the united states of america i don't know if somebody um one of our panelists wants to comment on that. I think what you've said is very consistent with a lot of what our panelists have been saying. Good. Well, um, if we think about uh, police brutality as a form of um, racialized violence, not unlike the form of racialized violence uh, known as lynching. You look at some of the early studies of lynching, uh, they dispel this notion that the behavior, uh, the deportment, the comportment of the victim explains the victimization. And so the point being is concrete example. Uh, Tamir Rice, 12 year old boy, is given a, poli a police officer who drives up to a playground, gives an order to this young man inside the police vehicle with the windows up. He opens the door to the police vehicle and le in less than two seconds, kills a child who's holding a, uh, a, a, a toy gun. In that situation, as in the case of George Floyd, it's not, there's nothing about the behavior. Uh, you can't be more respectable. You can't be more virtuous uh, to justify uh, humane treatment. So the point being here is I think all people need to be uh, virtuous uh, and comport themselves well, um, but that doesn't speak to um, the reality of police brutality. It, it just doesn't. Um, and so that's, that would be all I have to say about that. I'll, I'll also quickly um, add a note to John that um, I, I really appreciate your uh, thoughtful way in which you're thinking about um, being a Black person in the United States of America. One thing I'll note is that, um, uh, you know, all countries have uh, police and many countries use those police to enforce ethnic hierarchies. And so most certainly in times of conflict within a state, um, people know what it's like to be in the out group and to be subject to surveillance and various forms of indignities. So then the question is, the person who's in the out group, who's the representative of the out group um, that is being mistreated by the state as a result of uh, political conflict within the state, um, can they nice their way into being uh, acceptable? No, <laughs> because the point is that the police are enforcing some political agenda that is designed deliberately to intimidate that group. And so African-Americans are, are essentially moving in between different poles of political debate and possibility uh, between full acceptance, which hasn't quite happened, um, and extreme um, alienation. Uh, and so the history is that waxing and waning of those tensions. The irony, however, is that it's not that Black people could be more respectable at any given moment. It's that Black people should be fully credited for making the country desirable to an African in the first place. <laughs> because were it not for African Americans pressing the United States to be a multiracial democracy, the country would not be worth coming to for anybody. Um, and so, so that's, that's the great irony. It's not that black people have been kind of wards of the country and we should treat them better. It's that anything that it makes America worth being valuable 
in every dimension is a credit to the presence of African Americans because we essentially gave America her competitive advantage. In the 1940s, the State Department started sending out black cultural ambassadors, Louis Armstrong, Dizzy Gillespie, Duke Ellington. Why? To promote an image of America to the rest of the world in the scramble for the resources of post-colonial Africa. But at the same time, literally, it was the height of the Jim Crow era. It was a moment where Martin Luther King was just making his entry onto the world stage. So there's a lot of ways in which the idea of respectability has promoted America's sense of self in the world, but it's only in reaction to the demands of Black people to challenge America to live up to her principles. Let me add something before next Very quickly, because we have time for one more question. I want to give one more student yeah. a chance for uh, okay. to, to say something. I just don't want my comment to be taken out of context that I think Black people should be more respectful for them to survive in America. But what I was saying is that the central issue that there is, of course, discrimination, given the fact that history of America was actually was, was developed from slavery. It is a fact that has to be dealt with by the state. I was just saying that either way, uh, the, both communities need to talk and accept where they can actually meet in between. There's a reality that, you know, the brutal human treatment that has happened in America is unacceptable. And I, as a black person, I would be very, very, very thoughtful about living in the United States, to be honest because of that. So it's not that I don't understand the circumstances of people in America, but I also think there's a responsibility on the black community side to also discount certain, certain prejudices that are being pinned on them and are used as a basis of mistreating them. Because there are things you can work on. That, that, that was my point. Thank you for that clarification. We have time for one more quick question. Demarcus Bell, you can do it. All right. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, so DeMarcus Bell, incoming MPP student. Um, considering the racial foundations of Harvard itself, uh, the Professor Muhammad highlighted, uh, it was a foundation complicit in securing the continued educational and economic subjection of the formerly enslaved, um, and even adding compounding systemic trickle down since then to more recent and apparent projects at the Kennedy School, such as the 1990s gathering of police chiefs that gifted us stop and frisk. Um, understanding this history as a pretext, what should the role and the moral responsibility of the Kennedy School be, and not simply teaching toward marginal systemic reform, but actually leveraging the gamut of its resources, institutional infrastructure, and human capital to actually secure systemic transformation from our present conditions, which the school has largely had a hand in creating? Leo, I think <laughs> you might want to start. Who was that? That was, uh, thank you, DeMarcus. That was a question for you and Doug, I believe. Well, um, DeMarcus, um, you raise an important question, one that uh, Khalil and others of the school have been giving thought to, uh, including me, uh, and one that um, we are giving substantially more thought to. Um, we have uh, brought to the school uh, over the last few years um, a number of faculty members who uh, work on race and different aspects of public policy uh, to join faculty members who are already here. Uh, and uh, we hope that those faculty members will teach our students, will lead projects, will engage in the public discourse uh, in ways that can affect the outside world, um, but also um, uh, we know that we need to work on uh, what has happened at the Kennedy School and is happening at the Kennedy School in terms of how we uh, relate to each other. And both the role of the Kennedy School in the world and the operations of the Kennedy School uh, inside uh, need to be uh, anti-racist uh, in the future in a way that they have not been in the past. Um, but all of the different ways in which that will happen, that's part of what we're talking about now. And, um, and that sounds like you will become uh, part of that conversation, which I think will be uh, useful for us. I don't know all of the history of the Kennedy School. I'm a fairly recent arrival. Um, I think maybe Khalil and others on the call actually have looked into more of what the Kennedy School did in the 1990s. I just don't know. And I think 
Uh, and I think Khalil might think that that's a problem, that actually I ought to know more of that in order to, in order to steer the school more effectively in the future. I'm not going to put words in Khalil's mouth. He can, he can disagree. Um, but I know Khalil has said in other gatherings that understanding history is very important. I think that's probably true inside the Kennedy School as well as outside. Um, the last thing I'll say is there's a project uh, being for the, across the university uh, being led by uh, Professor Tamika Brown-Nagin, who is the Dean of the Radcliffe Institute. Um, and this effort, uh, which includes some representation from the Kennedy School, is looking to dig more deeply into Harvard's past, I think including all of the, all of the parts of Harvard, so that we can collectively at Harvard use that history to set our path more, more effectively uh, in an anti-racist direction in the future. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time, and but this is clearly only the beginning of, of um, long discussions within the Kennedy School and among the Kennedy School uh, community. And I just want us all to thank very gratefully our four panelists, our experts here, who have really, really done a fabulous job of getting us framed and starting to to think more deeply and continuing to think more deeply about these issues. Desmond Ang, Cornell Brooks, Khalil Muhammad, Leah Wright, Rigor, thank you very, very, very much. Virtual and real class.